All righty. Well, howdy, everybody. This is our May meeting of New Mexicans for Science and Reason. We're, we're waiting for our uh, speaker, Holly Olivares, to uh, log in. But uh, in the meantime, I hope everybody's uh, doing OK. Feel free to unmute yourself and, and say hello. Howdy, Mark. Austin, got your cameras hey, on. I'm going to check um, Facebook, see how that uh, event is going here. Where do you have? Uh, we may have a climate denier joining us tonight, but we'll see. OK. Wait, what was that? <laughs> oh, we, um, Mark Boslow has a next door site. Yeah. Hi, Holly. And Hi. Um, there's a climate denier who seems a little irritated that you're going to speak. <laughs> oh. So he might be joining us. We'll see. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. I feel I feel like I have lots and lots of support if he goes on the attack. Oh yeah, you have plenty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, trying to find the uh, event page. What's, what is the capacity of Zoom, by the way? I, I think we have 100 or so. Um, where is that? Now we can see what you look like, Austin. Thank you. <laughs> Howdy, Holly. I'm trying yeah. to um, navigate over to the event on Facebook to see if anybody else needed the uh, invite. But um, oh, maybe if I put events there. Let's see. I don't see any. All right, everybody that uh, expressed interest, I, I sent them the link. Great. All righty. Well, it uh, looks like it's officially 7 o'clock. Great. So um, let's, let's go ahead and get started. We got... 14 already. Um, all right, good to see everybody. Uh, oh, all righty, let me uh, just give a little intro here. Uh, all righty, our uh, speaker tonight is uh, uh, Holly Olivares. Um, hope I'm getting the accent on the right syllable. Yep. Let, me, let me know. <laughs> Uh, she's a, a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellow, and she has a passion for learning how to effectively communicate climate change in ways that prompt scientists and non-scientists alike to find their unique way to contribute towards climate change solutions. Uh, she's a scientist at uh, CU Boulder. Holly studies the ocean and climate change, specifically absorption of uh, CO2 by the ocean and uh, check out her website, climatechangetalks.com. So uh, Holly's uh, topic tonight is uh, coronavirus and climate change and uh, how they're connected and how it affects the health and safety 
of our uh, friends and family. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, let me get over to uh, Zoom here. Uh, okay, here we are. I'm going to um, hit the more button and make Holly a co-host. You are now a co-host, so uh, I think Holly uh, can uh, drive the car now and uh, start up her presentation. Sounds great. Thanks, Dave. All righty. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here this Wednesday evening. Uh, and let's see. Well, I guess if someone comes in, Dave, you can mute them if they're unmuted. Yes. Okay. Um, and I, I think unmuted is the default, so you have to un okay. you have to un uh, you have to unmute yourself. So I think uh, uh, muted is the default. Yeah. Okay. Muted is the default. Okay, got yeah. it. Yeah, but Great. you can, you just click your microphone and you should be good to go. Great. Sounds good. <laughs> or well, raise your hand. Right. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here. And my format is, um, this is a talk that I've given before. And um, I start out with just a, a brief, like five minute overview of what I do in my day job. Um, and then from there, move on to the connection between climate change and COVID-19. My talk is not technical. It's more focused on um, the, that we really need to focus on talking about climate change in our daily lives. Um, that being said, I'm definitely open to discussion following my presentation. The whole thing is about 30 minutes, so I think we have plenty of time. Um, and I'm definitely interested in getting your feedback and, and us engaging in a conversation um, about climate change and COVID-19. And um, there's, there's always plenty to talk about. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to share my screen. going to minimize. Okay. Excellent. It's looking good. Okay. So this is me, climate change, Holly Olivares. So as Dave mentioned, I study the ocean and climate change. A changing climate means a changing ocean. And as humans burn fossil fuels every year, the carbon more carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. So the first question is, what is carbon dioxide? Well, it's an invisible gas. Here it's shown in black for effect, but in the real, real world, it is invisible. It is very common on Earth, and it can be found in the air and in the ocean. It's produced naturally, but there are human-made sources too, such as the burning of fossil fuels. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which means that it can trap heat in the atmosphere and warm the planet. Extra carbon dioxide from human-made sources means a warmer planet. People burn fossil fuels when we're using most forms of electricity and when we drive our cars. So my question is, why does it matter if extra carbon dioxide is getting into the ocean? While it is good news for climate change that the ocean sucks up a lot of carbon dioxide when we burn fossil fuels, it is bad news for the ocean. And this is because when carbon dioxide dissolves into the ocean, it changes the chemistry of the water to make it more acidic. Today, the ocean is 30% more acidic than it was 200 years ago. In the ocean, there are tiny plants and critters that are so small that we need a microscope to see them. These tiny shelled plankton that live in the ocean don't really like it when the waters become more acidic. Even though they are tiny and mighty, um, their shells begin to dissolve, much like dropping a piece of chalk into a glass of vinegar. And these organisms sit at the base of the oceanic food web and have to use extra energy to build new shells when the water becomes acidic, which means that they have less energy to do other things like reproduce. And this is a problem because it means the entire oceanic food web can be affected by ocean carbon dioxide absorption. If there's fewer plankton, then there's less food for the bigger guys. So how much carbon dioxide is really getting into the ocean my research involves estimating the rate at which the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. I try to figure out whether this rate has changed in the past, and if it has, then to understand why. It seems logical to think that humans burn fossil fuels, and then that carbon dioxide touches the ocean at the same rate that it was added to the atmosphere, but it turns out that this isn't the case. While burning the fossil fuels can affect it, 
There are other things that can affect it, such as volcanic eruptions um, and the circulation of the ocean as well. For example, a huge El Nino event can impact how much carbon dioxide um, goes into the ocean in certain regions. And the rate can also change a lot from one year to the next and one decade to the next. So to discover if the rate has changed and why, I use computer simulations of the global ocean that also simulate fossil fuel burning and volcanic eruptions, as well as things like El Nino events. And by doing this, I'm able to help scientists around the world to better track the health of the planet and better near-term predictions and um, long-term projections of the future climate system can be made. So why do we care about all of this? Um, I say because the ocean is good to us. The ocean takes up more than 90% of the extra heat in the climate system. That's right, I said over 90%. And the ocean also takes up about one fourth of human made carbon dioxide that we emit to the atmosphere every year, which substantially slows the heating of our planet. Without the ocean taking up the extra heat and the extra carbon dioxide, the effects of climate change would have happened much faster than they already are. So there's three things to remember. One is that burning fossil fuels is affecting the ocean too. Number two is that ocean acidification is serious. And number three, humans get to choose what happens next um, by choosing how much uh, carbon dioxide, extra carbon dioxide we wanna add into the atmosphere. And a lot of times people ask me, what can I do? So I just started including that in all of my talks. Number one, trust the science, which I thought everyone in this audience would appreciate. Number two, talk about climate change, which I'm gonna to get to in my next um, slides. And then number three, reduce our individual, but more importantly, our collective emissions. So that's just the brief overview of what I do. And now I'll switch my slides to uh, the connection between climate change and COVID-19. So this is an image that some of you have probably already seen. It comes from Ed Hawkins. He has a website called uh, showyourstripes.info and it's representing annual temperatures. These are for New Mexico from the year 1895 until the year 2018. So from left to right, we're looking at time in color and the colors represent the temperatures. So obviously from left to right, there's a lot more blues and neutral colors with some reds mixed in. Of course, in the Southwest, uh, the climate is variable. Um, but uh, as you get over to the Holly? right, yeah. I'm uh, just seeing the globe and the and the three points, one, two, three. Oh, no. Okay, I'm sorry. It doesn't, I'm not seeing the slides it sounds like you're talking about. Oh, let me try that again. How's this? Oh, that looks better. Oh, good. Okay. Now you can see the colors that I'm talking about. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe just uh, do that, uh, go sure. over that part again. Yeah, I'll do it again. So this, uh, these colors represent uh, annual temperatures in New Mexico from the year 1895 to the year 2018. From left to right, we're looking at temperatures over time. So the blue colors obviously represent cooler temperatures and the red colors represent warmer temperatures. So from left to right, we're seeing much more blue and neutral colors with some reds mixed in. But as you get to the far, further to the right, all of the colors become red and then even more red. Uh, so this is a visual representation that helps us understand um, what's, what's happening with our temperature just even in New Mexico. This is the same idea as the figure that you're now seeing on the left side of your screen, which are the total cases of COVID-19 around the world as of um, about an hour ago. Um, and um, so what we're looking at, I'm gonna use my mouse, hopefully you can see it. Uh, and then, I'm sorry, and then the figure on the right is carbon dioxide or CO2 over the last 2019 years. So what I'm showing are the similar visual trends of the curve the blue line and the black line. So along on the left side for total coronavirus cases, um, we see kind of a, a slow and steady bump along and then this rapid jump in the number of cases and then that, that curve just keeps going up, up, up. And then over on the right for carbon dioxide, it's the same idea, it's the same principle where we're kind of bumping along steadily and then there's this um, quick jump and then just a, just a continuous increase um, and so this gives us a visual representation of the connection between COVID-19 and climate change. Another figure that you're probably familiar with is on the top of your screen, and that is the COVID-19, flattening of the COVID-19 curve. 
So now we're looking at along the y-axis number of people infected and along the x-axis time from first infection and then this dashed line is representing our healthcare capacity. So without any precautions, the number of people infected jumps up rapidly and we quickly exceed our healthcare capacity. But with precautions, such as physical distancing, then the number of people infected rises at a slower rate and the goal is to keep it below our healthcare capacity so that those who are infected have access to healthcare uh, if they need it. So on the bottom is the same curve, except now we're talking about flattening the climate curve and on the y-axis is the global temperature, and on the x-axis is time. And then the dash line is now representing two degrees Celsius or two degrees C, which is the temperature increase agreed upon by the Paris Agreement, an international agreement um, in deciding, uh, let's, try to, let's try to make the effort to keep our global temperature from increasing any higher than two degrees C. So without any climate protective measures, that global temperature just jumps up very rapidly and, and highly exceeds the two degrees Celsius goal. But with climate protective measures, that global temperature rises at a slower rate and hopefully we can keep it underneath our climate care capacity, if you will. <laughs> so another visual representation of figures that we've been seeing quite often and even those that aren't, aren't proficient in looking at um, charts and graphs have gotten used to seeing these figures. And so we can use these um, when talking about the principles or the connections between the two. But there are other ways that climate change and COVID-19 are um, connected. Both are global, both demand early action, and both are here now. I, recent, oof, let me go back. I recently heard um, Catherine Hayhoe, an atmospheric scientist, say that we are with climate change, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, we are with climate change, where we were with COVID-19 about three months ago. We were hearing about it in the news, but we weren't really feeling any of the impacts of it. And so we didn't really make any changes in our lives. Um, and it's the same thing with climate change right now. We're hearing about it in the headlines, but maybe we don't feel like it's really impacting us in our daily lives. And so we're not really making any changes. So those are, those are very um, similar principles that we can, we can make that connection between the two. But between the two, what, what they do have in common, most of all, in my opinion, is that we all want a safe place to live and we all want healthy friends, families, and communities. And we're feeling that more than ever right now in this pandemic that we're in. But the principle also applies to climate change. And I want to acknowledge that climate change isn't the first thing that's on people's minds right now, but for communicators like me and probably most of you, we do know that this is the, the best time for us to be talking about climate change because we can um, help people understand the seriousness and the urgency of climate change because it is as serious as the pandemic and it is as urgent as the pandemic. So what can you do to ensure that your loved ones are safe and healthy? I think the number one question that I get, and maybe you do too, is what can I do? And I think that the number one, people, number one thing that people can do um, in their daily lives is to do the same thing that they're doing about COVID-19, and that's talk about it. We need to be talking about climate change the same way that we're talking about COVID-19. And sim we simply just aren't yet, uh, and we need to start doing that. And so that's, that's my motivation for um, giving the talk today. There's a group at Yale, the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, They've been surveying United States Americans for about 20 years. And last November, they asked people if they think global warming is happening. And seven out of 10 said that they think that it is. So on this map of the United States, it's divided by county. And anything you see that's yellow, orange, or red is representing um, more than 50%. So that's positive uh, from where I sit, that seven out of 10 um, US Americans think that global warming is happening. If you see any blues, those are representing less than 50%. So another question that they asked uh, the same people that they were surveying is if they think global warming will harm future generations. And again, the response was seven out of 10. But when they asked people if they think global warming will harm them personally, the numbers changed significantly down to four out of 10. And so this is really telling uh, to what I was saying before about how we think we're hearing the headlines, maybe we don't think it's impacting us, even though it is impacting us, we think it isn't yet, 
Um, and so we're not really doing anything about it. And, and, and taking a step back from there, we don't do anything about something unless we're talking about it. We've got to be talking about it. Another question that the Yale program asked their, um, their survey, surveyees was if they hear about global warming in the media at least once a week, and the response went down to 32%. And then from there, they also asked people if they talk about global warming at least occasionally, and the number was 36%. And so if people aren't talking about it, why are people gonna care to do anything about it is really the, the question. I zoomed in on New Mexico and statewide that number is 36%. Um, I made myself a note in Bernalillo County, it goes up a little to 44% and in Socorro County, it was at, it's at um, 40%. So we're still below that 50% mark and we have some work to do, but I think these are important numbers for us to know um, as people that are out and um, trying to talk to people about climate change. Another question that they asked, and this is the one that really got me going, was asking um, those same people if they think scientists agree about global warming, and nationwide the number was 52%. So even though seven out of 10 think that global warming is happening, only about half of them think that scientists agree about global warming. And this, this is the one that really lit a fire under me, even as a scientist in training at CU Boulder, um, that I need to get out there and, and talk about climate change and talk to other people about how to talk about climate change. And I have my own story that I'm gonna share in, in just a minute, but um, that's really what prompted me is that someone talked to me and here I am in front of you today. And so I, I think that that's a, a really powerful tool that we all have and it's just a matter of figuring out how do we talk about climate change in a way that's effective. So we'll keep talking about that. Um, the other thing I was gonna say is that getting back to COVID-19, imagine thinking about these maps, imagine if only a few people were talking about COVID-19. So say we went back to here and we said, only 36% of United States Americans are talking about COVID-19 right now. Well, why would anyone be inclined to change their lifestyles if no one was talking about it? And so that same principle applies to climate change. And now is the time to help people make that connection as I mentioned before. Okay, so then, the next question gets to be, what do we talk about? Um, I suggest weird weather, which is easy to do in New Mexico and Colorado, as I'm now learning. I just moved here last August, um, but I was born and raised in New Mexico. Um, the flowers and trees are blooming earlier than ever. Spring is starting earlier. I have a slide later that's going to show in New Mexico, spring is starting six days earlier uh, as of uh, 2020 and that there's less snow that there used to, than there used to be. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can prompt talking about climate cha change without even saying the words climate change. It's just kind of helping people make that connection like, oh, this is happening here, it is happening now. We can also talk about um, shared values, shared faith, um, our families, our neighborhood, our kids, our grandkids, our shared interests. The goal is really just to find what you do have in common and then talk about that. So think about your climate change aha story. Uh, every time we find a unique way to talk about climate change, we're changing the fabric of understanding about this very serious situation. Even if we don't use the words climate change, we're progressing the global conversation. We may not think that we are, but we are. And that's where my story comes in. I was standing in line at the grocery store, um, I think about six years ago, and um, there was a woman who was bagging groceries, talking to a woman who was paying for her groceries. And the woman who was bagging her groceries said, it's more like global weirding. And I thought that was such a strange expression, but it really stuck with me. Um, and a few weeks later, I was on my laptop and it popped into my head. And so I Googled it. And when I Googled global weirding, I found this series that was hosted by PBS on YouTube called the Global Weirding Series. And it was a whole bunch of videos, short videos that were about five to seven minutes long. And each video answered one question about global warming. And they were um, hosted by a scientist. And the, the names of the videos were questions that I had asked myself, um, like, could this be a natural cycle? Or could it be the sun? Can humans have an impact on such a huge planet? Things like this. 
And so I was intrigued to, to click and watch the videos. And so I started, I think probably watched three or four the first day. And a few weeks later, I watched a few more. And within a few months, I decided to start sharing the videos on Facebook because I felt like they were reputable and trustworthy. And I felt like maybe my friends and family were having these same questions that I had. And a lot of times you can't just Google a straight question like that. Like one time I Googled, how can ice sheets grow if the global temperature is going up? And if you Google that, there's not really a website with a straight answer, or there wasn't then, there might be today, I haven't done it today. <laughs> but at the time I, I couldn't find the answer to that. And so I really liked these videos because they were sh so short and succinct in answering one question. And they were simple and there was no shaming and blaming and everything was in everyday English. And I really like that. So I started sharing it on my Facebook feed. And within a few months, um, I would have people that would write comments below or write me messages on Facebook or even ask me questions in person about climate change. And I didn't feel qualified at all to be talking about climate change. But I think because I had been sharing those videos, I was showing my family that this was something that was important to me. And so I also felt prompted to start learning a little bit more about climate change. And so it really did change my life, um, combined with other things, of course, but that was definitely a pivotal moment for me. And the woman in the grocery store will never know that she had that effect on me. And so we don't know what effect we're having on people, but we just need to trust that, um, that we're talking about climate change and that that's, that is making a difference. Another thing I'll ask you to think about is to think about your why. In my studies at CU Boulder, I've come to realize that people don't make decisions based on data and facts, and they don't make lifestyle changes because of data and facts. Um, and as a scientist, I've had to come to terms with that even in my own story. Uh, I'm not passionate about climate change because of the data and the facts. For me, the timing was right that when I heard the woman in the grocery store say global weirding, I had just started college. And as a young mom, I was about to become an empty nester. And so my family is in the photo on your screen. My daughter's on the left and my son is on the far right. And one had moved out, the other one was getting ready to moved out, move out. And I was actively searching for what was gonna be next uh, in my life. And the timing was right. I found climate change. <laughs> climate change was a problem big enough to fill the void of being an empty nester. And so for me, the timing, the timing was right, but that's my story. And I think everyone, I'm sure everyone on this call has your own story of when you made your own connection to climate change that prompted you to do something different in your life about climate change. And I think that's really the goal is that when we're, when we're making the, the effort to talk to people that we're recognizing that they have to make their own connection with it. And maybe we can help them figure out what the connection is just in our informal dialogue with them where we've, we've, we've brought up some interesting way to say that climate change is happening right here, right now. And when they make that connection on their own, they're that much more likely to do something different in their life um, and to really learn for themselves what's going on and what they can do about it in their own unique way. Another point that I wanted to bring up is that it matters where you live. Um, while this is a stunning image of Earth uh, from March 31st, I think it's really difficult for people to grasp how human behavior can impact something like average global temperature. And even though average global temperature is used, a term that's used by scientists and by the Paris Agreement, it really doesn't mean anything to the average United States American or anyone in their daily lives. I used to work in, uh, or the other thing I was gonna say is we are alive on earth, but we live in our neighborhood. I used to work in real estate and I would hear buyers often say that uh, they would talk about how, what they were willing to pay for a property. Um, but really what mattered was how comfortable they were with their monthly payment. And they had the sales price in mind, but really that was just a number. And until they had talked to their, their finance person to find out how comfortably that payment was gonna fit into their monthly budget, they didn't make the decision if they were gonna make an offer on the property or not. And I, I liken that to the idea of climate change, that we live on Earth, but really what we're thinking about is where we live locally. And so I think it's good to, to talk to people about what's happening locally in your neighborhood, in your city, in your state, even in our country. There are a lot of really good positive things that are happening right now in terms of our efforts to solve climate change, to do something about climate change. 
Um, and those, those are the things that we can seek out and, and talk to people about that are much more relatable because they're local. So there's a lot of excellent and reliable resources for us to share with our family and friends on social media. Because I, my own story includes social media having an impact on me and on my family and friends, um, I continue to use it widely. I'm on several apps um, that I share anything from beautiful images from Earth that are taken from satellites or whatever it may be that prompts conversation about our beautiful Earth and then we kind of go from there. And then I mix in things that I feel like are important for people to know about climate change, um, but a lot of times I'm, I'm sharing other people's posts that I feel are reliable and trustworthy. And so I've made some slides that I want to share with you of some resources that you might be interested in following that you can then share their posts with your family and friends. Um, I have all of these, um, they're, you're, you're gonna see them on my slides, but I also have them on my website. So if at a later time you'd like to go in and just follow them one at a time, you can go to my website, which is in the bottom left of my slides um, this evening, which is climatechangetalks.com. And I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Um, I'm happy to share these because I feel that they have reliable content. And by sharing them, you don't have to be the one that understands the climate system. As we all know, it's very complicated. Um, and you also don't know, have to know how to fix climate change. But you're, again, you're showing your, your family and friends that this is something that's important to you. And when you share, you learn. That's what happened for me. Um, and I think, I think it happens for other people too. And then the other thing about these resources is that they keep the conversation focused on solutions and on hope rather than on doom and gloom. And so in the top right corner for the rest of my slides, I have the apps that these um, resources are on. They're, they're, they're people and uh, groups. And then, like I said, you can also follow them on my website. So the first is Project Drawdown, which is a list of 100 existing solutions to reverse global warming. You probably have heard about it. Uh, this is my number one resource to go to to um, find existing solutions where we're not talking about waiting for technology or waiting for one thing to figure out what to do about climate change, but it's actually a list of things that we're already doing and that if we choose to focus our efforts on this list of things, we can not only um, slow down climate change, but possibly even reverse um, the effects of it. So that's exciting. Catherine Hayhoe, um, I mentioned earlier, she's the one that put on the Global Weirding series uh, from PBS and YouTube, and those videos are still available. She's recently made two new ones on the connection between COVID-19 and climate change, and also on um, the effect on our emissions from COVID-19. And she also, so she's very active on all three apps, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and she posts different content on all three apps and so I follow her on all of them uh, but specifically on Twitter she started compiling a list of climate scientists that are on Twitter and she's at over 3,000. So climate scientists are on Twitter it is a thing and if you're not on Twitter I recommend you get there and you can easily go to Catherine Hayhoe's account and follow or subscribe to her list of climate scientists and actually get to engage with climate scientists who my favorite part is that they share their results pretty quickly um, without having to wait for a, a published paper to come out. And I don't mean that they're, they're making claims before their, their research has been peer reviewed. It's more of kind of an interesting like, wow, look at this thing I just tried um, that they're sharing amongst their peers. And so I, I've really found that to be quality content. Um, and I'm grateful to Catherine for putting together that list. Next is Climate Central. They report the science and impacts of climate change and they make some local uh, locally focused graphics. So this one I just pulled from their website showing um, Albuquerque and Santa Fe spring coming earlier or spring coming six days earlier. So it's something that you can share on your social media. Skeptical Science you've probably heard of. It's a great website um, filled with climate change and climate myths that scientists and other professionals um, have kind of debunked these climate myths. And so it's chock filled with information. I usually use it if I have a specific question because if I just go to peruse, there's just so much information, it's overwhelming. Climate feedback is scientists checking news articles and rating the credibility. So for example, um, on their homepage, they have this article that came out that says, melting glaciers reveal lost island in Antarctica and humans are already visiting it. 
but then over here on the right, they show scientific credibility is at minus one. And so that's, that's helpful if there's something that you see and you'd like to kind of vet it um, or see if someone else has vetted it before you share it. NASA Global Climate Change provides quite a few um, just really stunning images of Earth in terms of climate change. And they also provide on their homepage, if you can see it, current carbon dioxide measurement, uh, current global temperature since 1880, Arctic ice minimum, ice sheets, and sea level. So that's interesting. I visit that frequently. NOAA, the Nationalist, uh, National Oceanic and At Atmospheric Administration, also provides a lot of graphics and easy to share um, items on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Inside the Greenhouse is a creative climate change communication group here at CU Boulder that is experimenting with things like climate change comedy night. They just did one a few weeks ago and it is really brilliant. Um, and using art and music in different ways, how can we help get the message out there in an effective way? And then if we can figure out the effective ways, then hopefully we can share those with other universities and other organized groups. And me, I'm on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm quite active on all three, and I would love for you to follow me. I'm also available to give this presentation to other groups. Of course, um, my presentation is always in flux, as you know, uh, when you give talks, and especially with the, the changes uh, with COVID-19. So my last slide, I just want to leave you with this. Um, you are qualified to talk about climate change. You don't have to know everything about the climate system and you don't have to know how to fix it, but you do need to talk about it. Even if you're confused, it's okay to talk about that. Even if you're conflicted, it's okay to talk about that. And the more you talk about it, the better you're gonna get at talking about it. And if you remember how you're thinking and talking about COVID-19 right now, you aren't sure you heard this or you heard that, but you're talking about it. And most of all, you're doing everything you can to keep your family and friends safe. So that concludes my uh, portion and I'm happy to chat with you all. I'm gonna open this up. There we go. All righty. Now I can see you again. Very good, well that was a, an outstanding presentation. Thank you. Got some, got some really good ideas there. Uh, just a technical question. What language are you writing your um, codes in? I or use the... Python. Python, okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. We move, oh no, Mark's here, yeah. Who did my cartoons? That was um, Cal Bracken. He's an illustrator here in Boulder, and he and I have teamed up. We're actually putting together a um, social media campaign where I can start sharing short clips um, about climate change, the, the connection between climate change and COVID, and then hopefully those short clips will get people to go to like a YouTube channel where there's a recording that they can watch. Um, where I have like moving animations going behind me and that sort of thing. So I'm definitely following a lot of what um, Catherine Hayhoe is doing, but kind of my own, my own spin on it. She, Catherine wrote to me today on Twitter and she actually shared some slides with me from a talk that she gave last night on the connection between COVID-19 and climate change. So she found me, <laughs> which is great because I've been following her for years. Yeah, thanks, Mark. <laughs> uh, Holly. Yeah. Um, so I show a, a, a short video on uh, acidification of the oceans uh, for my class. And yeah. uh, if it's okay, can I uh, show everybody? And, and just I, since that's your uh, expertise area, yeah. uh, I just wanted to make sure it was a, a good video, not, not too far out there or yeah. anything. Absolutely. All right, I'm going to... Uh, Start that up, share the sound, and see if I can get this to work here. Um, share, oh, gotta, gotta do something. Here we are. And all righty. So uh, I'm 
I'm going to start this movie. It's from the NOAA, so pretty, pretty credible source. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a scary little movie. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's okay. that's always the challenge is you don't want to scare people. You want to empower them, right? Um, yeah. But this one, it, it's, uh, it gives you cause for concern. Yeah. I, th I think um, sometimes I'm not able to uh, run the videos the first time. Marine pterapods, there we are. or sea butterflies, are found throughout the ocean and they're a major food yet. source for fish and oh, a little. Like there we go. There it goes, In yeah. laboratory experiments, this pteropod oh, yeah, yeah. dissolved over the course of 45 days in seawater adjusted to an ocean chemistry projected for the year 2100. What changes in the ocean might be putting pteropods at risk? The burning of fossil fuels has caused levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to rise. This carbon dioxide, or CO2, doesn't just stay in the atmosphere. Roughly 30% of it is absorbed by the ocean. When CO2 reacts with water, it forms carbonic acid, which quickly releases a hydrogen ion, or H+. The more hydrogen ions, the lower the pH, or more acidic a solution is. As CO2 levels increase over time, seawater will progress towards the acidic end of the pH scale, a process called ocean acidification. We can make projections of this change in the ocean pH over time. It is expected that later this century, if CO2 emissions continue at the current rate, the average pH of the ocean will drop from 8.2 to 7.8. This relatively small decrease in pH may not seem significant, but it could impact many species of marine life. For pteropods, corals, and other species that depend on shells and exoskeletons, ocean acidification will lead to a decreased availability of dissolved calcium and carbonate, the chemical building blocks they use to make their shells and skeletons. If ocean chemistry changes as expected, shells with calcium carbonate mineral structures may begin to dissolve, depending on where they live in the ocean. How do we know that ocean acidification is happening? Scientists at NOAA and across the world have measured these chemical changes over the past 40 years through research cruises, taking hundreds of thousands of ocean water samples. Shown here are the results from cruises in 1991 and 2005, where the availability of the shell mineral was sampled. In both years, the highest concentration of available shell minerals were found in the surface waters as shown by the dark yellow colors. Deeper waters naturally have very low availability of these minerals. However, when we look at how these values have changed between 1991 and 2005, we see that the availability of the shell mineral decreased much more in the surface waters, as indicated by the blue colors. In other words, ocean acidification is impacting shallower areas much more than deep areas. Shallow waters are where the bulk of the ocean productivity occurs, including the most diverse and economically important species and habitats. And these changes aren't occurring in just certain parts of the ocean. They're occurring throughout the entire ocean. Today, repeated research cruises and permanent sampling stations continue to monitor changes in pH and availability of calcium carbonate minerals. As the ocean approaches a critical transition between shell building and shell dissolving, food webs in the world's oceans could be impacted. Phytoplankton and zooplankton, like pteropods, form the basis of most oceanic food chains. Coral reefs form the foundations of the most diverse marine habitats, and shellfish, such as oysters and crabs, and finfish, such as salmon, support economically important fisheries in many of the world coastal communities. People depend on the viability of these species to ensure a healthy future of our own. Yeah, that's great. All right. I actually, I just got asked to be NCAR's expert for the day in a couple of weeks, which I'm very excited about. Um, and so I'm going, my plan was to take the first slideshow that I showed all of you, but then from there to transition to um, the video that you just showed, but turn it into a, an interactive slideshow 
with the attendees where we have kind of conversation by way of chat as I show each shell at each stage um, because they ran this experiment where they showed, they tested um, pH of water and they, they actually put in pteropods to see what happened to their shells over time. And so they kind of show how they dissolve over time. So I'm going to incorporate that. So we're, we're thinking like Great. <laughs> so uh, Holly, you may have seen the uh, controversial documentary called um, Planet of the People. Right. And um, I posted a critique of it on uh, March for Science Albuquerque. I think it was from Climate Communications yeah. <clears throat> that Mark Boslow recommended. But I was wondering uh, if you saw it and what you thought. Any comments? I, well, to be perfectly honest, I saw I, I quickly saw the response from climate scientists on Twitter, and so I haven't, I haven't watched it. <laughs> That's it, it's it, pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, it, the timing of it was also during my finals week, so <laughs> that was part of it, too. But then over time, I've seen so, I did see that you posted that on Facebook, uh, and I've seen so many that I thought, I don't know that it's worth it for me to yeah. watch. I mean, it might be <laughs> in case I need to engage in dialogue with people. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll put it on the list, but yeah, it sounds like it's it's a lot of misrepresentation, which is unfortunate because I think maybe Michael Moore was maybe perceived more as someone that was um, focused on doing something about changing, you know, about about slowing down our rapidly changing climate, and now it appears he's not. Yeah, so that I don't know what is confusing. Pardon? I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's confusing. It's confusing for people that really aren't sure what's going on. So that's unfortunate. Yeah. And I saw Tish uh, wrote in the chat, I heard that early in the Trump administration, things about climate change were removed from the NASA and NOAA websites. Do you see that as a current issue still? Um, personally, I do not. I think of what I've seen on Twitter from people is that they still are finding um, what they need on the websites. There are some things that I think are maybe harder to find, but that being said, I think that always happens in the progression of changing websites, <laughs> that stuff kind of gets buried in deeper layers, but it's still there somewhere. Um, but that being said, I, I know it's certainly an issue in, in, on many fronts, but I think uh, for NASA and NOAA, from what I can see on NASA and NOAA's social media accounts, um, they're not they're not missing a beat. They're just moving full full speed ahead in their efforts. Does anyone have a different opinion than me? She says, "Good to hear." Holly, can yeah. you? Yeah. Yes. This is Austin Meaty. I have a huge problem talking about the myths of COVID-19 with people when I tell them that their assertions are false. And they, they come back and they say, well, I believe it. And I have no handle on how to react or even how to interfere with, with their thinking process. Have you, do you have any comments that would help me uh, handle this situation? Right. Okay. And also, thank you for a very nice talk. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so if I understand your question, you're talking about COVID-19 or coronavirus, but it's the same conversation that a lot of us are having about climate change, right? <laughs> Where Correct. It's, yes. people are saying, I don't believe that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I, 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 haven't, I don't have a good one-liner for COVID, but I have heard a good one for climate change. And that is uh, from Catherine Hayhoe. She says that uh, um, a thermometer doesn't care if you're red or blue. <laughs> it just tells the temperature. <laughs> and so, I mean, you, you can say that generally about science as well, is that it's not, it's not a belief system. Uh, I know I've had that conversation with my own family. I have a family member right now that's, she's just really sick and tired of being at home. And so the, there must be something else going on that they're keeping us at home, that sort of thing. Um, and so we, we kind of go back and forth. I think it's a lot of listening on my part and a lot of acknowledging how she feels. I think a lot of times people are looking for acknowledgement. I think they're confused and they're in fear. And so um, I've, I've worked in my own conversations on number one, staying calm, 
And number two, um, like I was saying, just acknowledging what they have to say, repeating it back to them to make sure I understand. And, and so then I'm really showing them with my body language and my tone that I, I care about how they feel about this, you know, and that I, I can acknowledge that they're having feelings about it. And I think that, that maybe even if they walk away and I don't feel like I got through to them, they're still gonna think about what I said. And that's the best, personally, I think that's the best I can do. Thank and you. it takes time. Yeah, I agree, yeah. I agree. Thank you again. Sure. Um, Holly, what you were uh, saying just a minute ago reminded me of uh, Henry Pollock. He's a University of Michigan professor uh, and he's written a, a book on ice uh, and, and it's, uh, you know, disappearance in our world. And, and his, his comment uh, that reminded me of yours was uh, that, that ice is, is not political. It's not red or blue. It, it just melts. And uh, so, you know, pretty powerful comment there. Yeah, absolutely. There's not a lot you can dispute <laughs> when someone yep. says that. <laughs> yeah. I was curious, I have, I have questions for you all if you're willing. I'm curious, um, now that I live in Boulder, which is a climate science hub, thanks to NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and also NOAA is here, and then CU Boulder, um, and then a few other places as well, there's a lot of climate science happening and I'm in a position where I'm able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with climate scientists. And specifically for my research, I'm meeting with modelers that are working on the, the earth system model provided that's, that's put together by um, NCAR. And I'm really focused on, uh, of course, I, I set up the meeting so I can talk about my research or I have a question about how they put volcanic eruptions in the model or whatever my questions may be, but I always use the opportunity to ask them or engage in conversation with them about their own climate change conversations. And I overwhelmingly have had the same response from the scientists that I've met with that they don't feel qualified to talk about climate change. And when I was an undergraduate not long ago, I that's how I felt, but I never thought I would hear a climate scientist say that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I put the question out to you, how do you feel about it? I, and I, I, I think it becomes a conversation about the culture of science communication um, when it comes to climate change and how do we, how do we um, keep the kind of sanctity and the integrity of the scientific method and the scientific process of peer review and that sort of thing, but we're also communicating the importance and urgency of climate change. Anyone have thoughts on that? Uh, I think, you know, as we're exploring all these new uh, concepts and reports, um, the, the scientists that I know, if, if they hear something uh, startling, or even if it's uh, in line with what they'd rather be the case, they'll, they'll check on that. They'll say, who's who's uh, writing this report or other scientists corroborating it. Um, so we, you know, before we share that wacky story on Facebook, we'll go, is this on Snopes? Um, <laughs> and, and that's proper uh, skepticism. And then when I see stuff uh, that is wrong, I, uh, even if it's my friends that are posting um, things like uh, Donald Trump's statement that uh, he was going to be a Republican because uh, in, in, in people 19, 1998, he didn't say that. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll tell people, hey, that uh, doesn't hold up there. Check your sources. But that's um, something we all can do is check your sources and uh, talk to people and uh, make sure you're not uh, going on a wild goose chase. Sure. I think I'm, I'm curious as to if climate scientists are talking about climate change in their own daily life and is that what was that etiquette and now is it etiquette because of because of the seriousness of climate change that scientists can be talking to people if if i'm making sense looks like something's coming in from mark oh and i, I skipped a question from randy i'm sorry about that I, th I just saw the word Bigfoot and I thought it was just a joke, but now I see <laughs> you did ask a question. It says, can you suggest resources to help 
in dealing with colleagues or peers who dismiss climate change the way I dismiss Bigfoot sightings. <laughs> And then looks like Brian responded, my first step is to, re to direct them to a skeptoid episode. <laughs> so ho hopefully we have answered your question, Randy, but if not, if you'll ask again, then we'll, we'll address it. And then Mark says, I think that as trained scientists, we are qualified to figure out who the real experts are. I think it is perfectly acceptable for us to say that we aren't experts, but that we listen to experts and that we can help people find out answers to their questions, yeah. I, that's definitely my my approach because I don't have every every answer. My goal while I'm in um, while I'm in the PhD program at CU Boulder is to be fluent in explaining the climate system, um, and that's what I'm working on in in my research. The research project that I chose was exactly for that reason, so that I can become fluent. But that that being said, I'll never none of us will ever know everything, right? I just really, I just really have been surprised when I'm sitting down with a 30 plus year climate science veteran who's saying, I don't feel qualified to talk to people about climate change. Because <laughs> if he's not feeling qualified, what does that mean for me? <laughs> and so where, where is that line that we, we, we can talk to people? And, and really what I've, what I've come to for myself is I'm definitely qualified to talk about talking about climate change. And so I, I'm confident in my ability to give a talk about that. And then as I go, I'll continue to, to increase my knowledge in explaining the climate system. But the other thing that I'm learning is that when you're a scientist, people don't really care what you do in your day job. <laughs> Would you agree? They're interested in the fact that you are a scientist and that you know things. And maybe you can answer this question for me because you're smart. <laughs> But they don't really inquire about what you do in your day job. Am I wrong? Yeah, I I have a troll on my Facebook page who I know, so I'm I'm trying to help her rather than just block her. But also, I'm speaking to everyone that listens to her as an example. But she doesn't seem to understand that scientists will refer to other experts when the question is outside their field. Yeah, and. I'll refer to an expert and she'll respond with a conspiracy guy mm -hmm. and it's an endless loop, but I, I know I can't change your mind, but I'm really talking to the people that are watching. But yeah. the main idea is that scientists will refer to other experts. Yeah. And um, so it's very frustrating, but I suspect in your case, the experts who don't feel qualified to speak might be talking more about the psychology of talking to you know, someone uh, about their field or something like that. That's a whole art. Yeah, yeah. You, you bring up a good point, definitely about um, what you were saying about the troll on your Facebook feed. But I, th I, th I do agree with you, it's how to talk to people um, about climate change. And so I've been, I have been interested in taking the talk that I'm giving now and just adjusting it a little bit and maybe taking it to this, the climate scientists at NCAR to say, hey, let's talk about how do you talk to people about climate change? Yep. So we'll see, what, we'll see what happens. Okay, Mark Boslow says, I think that as trained scientists, we are qualified to figure out who the real experts are. I think it is perfectly, ex oh, did I already read that? Yes. Now he says, everyone deferred to professor on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> he knew everything, but does anyone know what he was a professor of? <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good point. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, Holly, Holly, yeah. I, uh, this is Austin Media oh. again. I would like to go back to what Dave mentioned about the fact that even when you present facts, or documentation that somebody's myth is incorrect, they don't accept it. They just say, oh, that's it, that's it, you're, you're wrong. Yeah. Uh, and again, it's sort of, in my opinion, it's a roadblock that I have not got a good handle on how to get over. But again, again, thank you for your comments. Yeah, they're, absolutely. They're spot on. Yeah, thanks. Um, there are studies now by psychologists um, that, the more you show data and facts, 
Actually, even the more you show data and facts to educated people, the more they dig in their heels. And so knowing that, it's, that's the last thing you want to do is give them data and facts, right? <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's just finding whatever it is. You, you kind of have to find what their Achilles heel is. What are they worried about? Let's talk about that. Because you can always bring it back to climate change. I don't think I have found a topic yet that I haven't been able to bring back to climate change. <laughs> I try. <laughs> Everything from prices in the grocery store, it just goes on and on. Yeah, Joe. Uh, my hope uh, about climate change is really uh, like the uh, effort to ban smoking. For years and years, we went through facts and facts and facts of cigarettes are bad for your health, and yet it didn't change anybody's mind. And then suddenly, like this curve you were talking about early, where it suddenly takes off and shoots up like coronavirus or climate change, the public opinion suddenly changes and shoots off. Yeah. So I'm just hoping that within the next few years, that curve will just take off and we'll really realize and begin to do something about climate change. Yeah, you make a very good point. I almost said that when I was showing those, those two graphs with the similar curves. I, w I wanted to say, hopefully, hopefully this will be a curve for our, <laughs> our climate change efforts because we are putting in the work and the effort and we're bumping, we're bumping along steadily in our efforts. And so hopefully that, that curve is gonna jump right up. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm hopeful for that. Holly, uh, one of the uh, things that one of our uh, early uh, governors or not you know too early, but uh, Bruce King, Mm -hmm. I, I remember him from uh, when I was a child, um, Democratic governor, um, and he he really endeavored to to find common ground. So he'd have people polarized on opposite sides of an issue, and and he'd sit them down. and And his first order of business was to find something they all could agree on, and and then using that as a basis, then then you can, uh, uh, you know, sort of bring up these different ideas. I, I find. Uh, when I'm arguing or with uh, trying to influence uh, people on the internet or what have you, um, if you, you know, ask them, well, you know, tell me, you know, what makes you proud to be a, a climate denier? Why do you get up in the morning and, and do that? Uh, and if you listen to them, if you give them uh, the time to uh, explain, you know, where they got their point of view from, then later when, when you're trying to explain your point of view, uh, they will be more inclined to, to listen to you because you showed uh, showed them some respect. And it's sort of building on this, uh, you know, if you can find common ground, start with that and, and build out. Yeah, I agree. I used to work in sales before I started school, and um, we just called it getting the yes. <laughs> you just keep getting the yes. So you find the first thing that they say yes about, and then you find the next thing that they say yes about, and by the time it's time to sign on the dotted line, it's a no-brainer for them because they've been saying yes, yes, yes all along the way. <laughs> and so definitely that's a, a very, very similar um, approach where you're just, you're looking for that connection so that you can make the space for the next thing that you're gonna talk about. And it does take time. I mean, I'm sure you all have family members or friends that it's been a decade or more, and now you hear them starting to talk about climate change, where, you know, a decade ago it was, arms were crossed. Mark Boslow says, is it time for skeptical donuts? <laughs> Do you all know what that means? <laughs> so Holly. Thanks, Tish. Yes. Hi, Conrad. Yeah, this is, yeah how you doing? Good. I, I, uh, I invited I, Conrad. I just wanted to uh, send out a quote that uh, actually I forwarded to Holly. And uh, the quote actually, I think came from Catherine Hayhoe, 
but it says we're just asking people not to be blind to evidence instead of asking anyone to blindly accept scientific evidence. So the key is just listen to my evidence and you know, don't blindly not accept it, right? So that's, that's the key. Yeah, yeah, that's well said. Any other thoughts or comments? Well, I, I think that was a, a stirring presentation. Uh, certainly got lots of good ideas. I'm gonna, oh, um, yeah, we uh, will have the, the video uh, later. So I'll, I'll make that available from the NMSR page and I'll send it out to the usual suspects. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, and, the, and the way your talk was, I think um, the actual presentation itself, uh, it's probably just better just to, to watch the video because, um, you know, not too many details, uh, more, it was more of your words and interactions. Yeah, definitely. Hey, thanks, Mark. He says, we enjoyed your presentation. You're on your way to being the next Catherine Hayhoe. <laughs> all right. He knows how much I really, I really appreciate all of her efforts. She's decades in, and she's really put herself out there to be uh, a voice uh, for science. And I think she's very effective in how she does it. And now she's experimenting with all these different types of audiences. Like she did a Q&A with a famous snowboarder on Instagram the other day. <laughs> and talking about how climate change is going to impact snowboarding. Wow. So diff different things in different ways like that to get different audiences engaged. Um, and she's also finding ways to give virtual talks that keep her audiences um, participating. So she does polls or she has people write words in the chat. And then as they're typing in their words, a word cloud builds on the screen. So you can see you know, what matters most to people when it comes to climate change or what do you do for a living or that sort of thing. So they're, they're just engaged as audience members, which is valuable in, in these times since we're all on Zoom anyway. So I'm definitely in, aspiring to, to build up to that. I'm grateful to, grateful to all of you for giving me the opportunity to present to you. And I'm glad I got to present because I know Dave and I were talking about this in like last October, December. <laughs> It, it, it was hard to get you come all the way down from Boulder. <laughs> I know you but, think it wouldn't be so here hard. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this worked out great. But yeah, Alrighty. sometime when I'm in Albuquerque, I'd certainly love to come and meet you all in person. Oh yeah, we'd uh, love to to hear it again. Um, cool. You you it, it'll take you a while to catch up to the the Mark Boslow. I think he's given uh, eight or nine uh, talks oh, wow. to NMSR. Yeah. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> I really like there Mark. Mark Mark actually, um, um, he says not as many as Ben Radford. Yeah, I think Ben is our, our number one there. Yeah. <laughs> Mark actually um, was a mentor to me when I gave this talk for the very first time, just on talking about climate change. And he had a really great idea that I should invite a TV meteorologist to be one of my speakers and have the TV meteorologist talk about um, how he feels about climate change and how can you talk about climate change on the air and that sort of thing. And it went over really well at the time um, because the TV meteorologist um, was un unsure about climate change, but he was willing to talk about it. And I thought, man, what, what the perfect person to come and talk about this because this is the whole point is that we need to be talking about it even if we're not sure. And he, it really worked out well and so now Mark Boslow says, it was a good idea for a TV meteorologist, but a bad idea for a GOP candidate for US Senate. <laughs> yeah, he, <laughs> he shortly after that quit his job as a TV meteorologist and is now running for New Mexico Senate. <laughs> um, I can't even think of his name, Mark. Mark Ronchetti. Ronchetti, thank you. <laughs> it's like, delete, no. <laughs> Um, so yeah, he's, he's now, we're, we're kind of waiting to see what he's going to, what his stance is going to be on climate change, but certainly at my event, he was, uh, he was on board. He had done his own research of um, the difference in temperature, the difference in
daytime versus nighttime temperatures in Albuquerque for the last 80 years. And I think he found, uh, Mark, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think he found there was like a three to four degree um, difference. And that really shocked him. And when he saw that for himself, yeah, Mark Boslow saying, Holly, you suggested that he look at overnight lows. I did because he, the first time I talked to him on the phone, he said he had looked at um, average summertime temperatures for the last 10 years and that they weren't going up. And so he thought climate change isn't real. And I said, well, that's great. You're thinking like a scientist, but try it this way. Look at the difference between the daytime temperature and the nighttime low and go farther back than 10 years because climate is decades of, of recorded temperatures. And so then when he gave his talk, he said he had gone 80 years back looking at nighttime lows and daytime highs. And that's when he saw, wow, the temperature is going up. And this is, this is concerning. I'm concerned is what he said. And so that, that was a pretty great moment for, for me. And I know for Mark Boslow too, that, that we had, or he had this idea. I took it to fruition. We got a meteorologist to come and talk. Um, and then here he was on the stage saying like, yeah, this is, this is a real thing. And I don't know, I can't say climate change on the air, I'll get fired, but I can talk about how the flowers are blooming earlier. I can find creative ways to be talking about how the trends are changing. And that was really cool. So, and I know there are other TV meteorologists that are doing that more and more across the country and hopefully it will continue. But um, in this case, we may, we may have lost him. <laughs> We'll see. Well, we'll see if uh, party loyalty uh, is uh, greater than scientific integrity. Yeah. All yep. right. But let's let's hope that. Uh, I mean, I'm. I'd like to encourage Republicans to to be scientific. Um, so absolutely. If, well, if, well, uh, yeah. if he's still willing to to listen to reality, uh, that could be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I talked to Mark Boslow, and we had that conversation of like well, this could be so great. He could be the first Republican that's outspoken saying we need to do something about climate change. This would be amazing. So, so far he hasn't said it, <laughs> but we're, we're watching and waiting and hoping. Alrighty. Cautiously hoping. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, uh, thanks for uh, attending everybody. We'll, we'll have this on uh, video later for your uh, perusal. Uh, great big thanks to Holly for doing a splendid presentation. Absolutely. Thanks again all to all of you. Alrighty. Stay safe out there, everyone. Bye. All right. All right. I'm going <laughs> to pull the plug Anna. here. <laughs> See you. Uh, we, we still don't know what we're doing next month, but we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. Take care.